Okay, here we go. When we made our trip to Israel last March, one of my favorite, favorite places was up there in the area around the Sea of Galilee, up on the side of this mountain where they tell us Jesus gave what we call the Sermon on the Mount, recorded primarily in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Beautiful area, looking out over there, it is a great spot. And if you did last week's assigned reading, you read Matthew chapter six every day, your assigned reading this week is to read Matthew chapter six out loud every day. Really important, out loud. You will be amazed at what'll happen if you will read the scriptures to yourself out loud. You'll hear a whole lot more rather than just doing that uh, in that silent manner. It'll mean a whole lot more to you. But if you, if you read, you notice there's a rather interesting pattern in the teaching that Jesus did here in these five separate areas in the life of a believer. Now remember this, we're in a transition time. Jesus has come, he is fulfilling the law, every step of it all the way, but he's calling us to follow him. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man gets to God the Father except through me. I am the bread of life, I am the water of life. Jesus is making all of these statements to the folks and he's saying, all right, it's time to lay that down and follow me for I am the fulfillment of all of that law. And in calling us to follow him, he talks about a group that runs rampant over the earth in regard to religious activities, and that's a group called hypocrites. Fred Smith gave me a great definition of that word hypocrite a number of years ago. He said a hypocrite is someone who claims to be something he never intended to be. And when you think about that definition and look here in Matthew 6, in the opening section, Jesus is teaching about giving to the needy and he says, don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired. When you give a gift to a beggar, don't shout about it as the hypocrites do. Blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. Then Jesus goes on to tell how you should give those gifts. In the matter of prayer, he says in verse five that when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who pretend piety by praying publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. That's all the reward they're gonna get. He also says don't recite the same prayer over and over as the heathen do who think prayers are answered only by repeating them again and again. And then he goes on to give instruction in how to pray, pray along these lines. Thirdly, he talks about fasting. He says, when you fast, that is when you're declining food for a spiritual purpose. You're not, you're not fasting because you're too ton Tony and no, you gotta knock some of that off. You're doing it for a spiritual reason. When you fast, don't do it publicly as the hypocrites do who try to look wan and disheveled so people will feel sorry for them. Truly, that's their only reward. Then he tells you how to fast. Then he comes talking about money and he says, don't store up treasures here on earth where they can erode away or may be stolen. Then he talks about how you're supposed to do that. And finally, talking about worry, he says, don't worry about things. Well, we worry a lot about things. Jesus said, look, you're, you're my followers. Don't worry about things. And he goes on to say, don't worry at all about having enough food and clothing. Why be like the heathen for they take pride in all these things. That's where their pride is focused in the things and they're deeply concerned about them. But your heavenly father already knows perfectly well that you need them and he will give them to you if you give him first place in your life and live as he wants you to. See, one of those conditional things that God has laid out for us. Give him first place in your life. And when we go back and look at this matter concerning money, I want to talk to you about this a little bit. Jesus always warning here against the problem that people have of doing a good deed with the wrong motive. Jesus says, do the good deed with the right motive. 
have the right purpose in your heart for doing this good deed. And when he gets into talking about money, he's touching on an area that was very, very prevalent in their time, the Pharisees. Now, they're the, the uh, intellectual, religious leaders of the day, a particular body of people that had authority with the folks. The Pharisees in particular and the Jews in general gave undue emphasis upon material wealth as an evidence of God's approval. If you saw a fellow who was rich, you said, boy, God's really blessed him. My, look at it, all the stuff God has given him. That's carried over to the Gentiles. We still do that. Oh, look at that fellow. God's really smiling on him. Oh my, isn't that wonderful? And thinking that there's some kind of, of thing that ties together with God, approval of a man and a man's bank account. Said that isn't true. Nothing true. A lot of scoundrels and skunks got lots of money in this world, in case you didn't know it. Have no time for God. Don't care about God. Are open in saying, tell God to go forget it. Pass. Hang it on his nose. I don't, I don't need anything. Just forget it. But God comes to us in, in Jesus' words here, and he says, don't store up treasures here on earth where they can erode away or be stolen. Now let me tell you what he's not saying. He is not saying, don't make any provision for those years when you cannot work. Don't take all your money and do something with it so that one day you wind up and your job is over with and you don't have anything and you come back and throw yourself on the mercy of people and say, well, I just, I just gave it all away and I don't have anything left. Now it's my turn, somebody give something to me. I think God expects us to use our heads about making a plan should we live to be 95. I'm planning on that myself. And I think he wants us to put a plan together so that when we can no longer work and draw a salary, we have something to go on without going to our kids and saying, would you take us two old timers in? They might say no and shut the door and then you're in trouble. So that isn't what he's saying. He isn't saying don't make any provision for the future. He's saying don't store up treasures here on earth where they can erode away. That's an interesting word. Some places it's translated where the moths can get in it. You see, in that day and age, clothing, expensive clothing was a very important item. And a lot of judgment was made on how wealthy you were by the clothes that you wore. A couple of old boys in the Old Testament, I don't have time to go into them right now, but they got in big trouble because they were stealing stuff, clothing, good stuff, stealing it and hiding it. One of them got a whole bunch of people killed because he did that because they lost the battle, old Achan. And so I just say to you that you need to understand that he's talking about things. He's talking about stuff, piling up those treasures. Now, moths still operate. You know, some of you have stuck something back in the closet and thought, I'm going to wear that someday. And it's been there 17 years. And you thought one day it's the right place for it. And you pulled it out. And the moths went everywhere in the holes or it looked like you'd been in battle with that thing. It was shot through and through. Still happens. And you say, it's so bad now, I can't even give it to the Highway City store. It was a time when I could have given it away. And I said, no, that, I'll keep that. Storing it up. Now, God says on the other side, verse 20, store your treasures in heaven where they will never lose their value and are safe from thieves. Simple statement. Simple command, store your treasures in heaven where they'll never lose their value and are safe from thieves. If your prophets are in heaven, your heart will be there too. He says that same statement just a little differently in Luke chapter 12, wherever your treasure is, there is your heart and your thoughts will also be. Where your treasure is. Restaurants all over this town, early in the morning, People are there with the newspaper wide open. They're checking to see how their stuff is doing on the open market. And if it went down, they're really depressed. If it went up, they're elated. But their whole day hinges on what the report is on how their stuff is doing. You got too much. If you're worrying that way, you got a problem. Because I would like for you to think, he says there's a reason for preaching this sermon. I've got a crowd that needs this sermon. I know that 80% of this crowd does not really help carry the load in this church. 20% of this crowd carries the major financial load in this church. So I know I got a bunch of live ones out here from a standpoint of needing this message. 
and you can hide and duck and do all you want to, but I know it's the truth because I have worked my way through those books for the last many years. I know those are the normal stats across the country. 20% of the people do 80% of the work and pay 80% of the bill. It ought not to be. And I just believe that God wants to lay his hands on us and work through us to do some mighty things in this community far above what we've ever dreamed about. But until God's people will come to the party and become obedient in the area of money, it's not going to happen. And so I simply lay this on you where your profits are. That's your heart and your treasures all there with it. And he says, store them in heaven. You say, how do I do that? Well, you put money into God's work. That's how you do that. I'm not on a commission, okay? So don't anybody say, well, he must be bucking for a raise. No, not at all. Uh, going to four services, big deal. No increase in pay. It's just part of the action. Important if we're going to get the doors open and get people. I was talking to a lady today, and she's talking about a friend of hers, that, that very conservative person that came here to church recently. The first Sunday came was July 2nd. Well, July 2nd, we had Debbie Hergenrader coming down this aisle, doing cartwheels down this aisle. We had a wild music up. Everything is rolling. And this woman just kind of gulped. <laughs> and then our gal said to her, you know, we're going to four services because we don't have room in three. And we kind of live with the notion that if we only stay with three, we're telling the rest of town to go to hell. And the lady said, well, it seems a little abrupt to say it that way, but... I guess that's what it is, isn't it? See, if we say this enough, we're in. Forget the rest of the world. Forget the rest of the town. Then we're in deep trouble, not paying attention. By sharing our treasure in the work of the Lord with those who are carrying the good news of salvation, those who are discipling others, those that are helping the poor and the needy in the name of Jesus, we obey what Jesus had to say. Then he said an interesting thing. If your eye is pure, there'll be sunshine in your soul. But if your eye is clouded with evil thoughts and desires, you are in deep spiritual darkness. And oh, how deep that darkness can be. Easy to read that and say, what in the world did he drop that in for? Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you. He dropped that in because he knew what's in our hearts. Now look at this First Timothy 6 thing again. He says, people who long to be rich soon begin to do all kinds of wrong things to get money, things that hurt them and make them evil-minded. Mm, let's go back over here and see what Jesus said. If your eye is pure, if your eye is clouded with evil thoughts and desires. What's the cloud? Money. Money. Stuff. i got to get more. Makes them evil-minded, finally send them to hell itself for the love of money, not money. The love of money is the first step toward all kinds of sin. Jesus said it. I didn't say this stuff, okay? Going out here mad at me isn't going to get it. You got to deal with God on this issue. And then Jesus wound up saying this. You can't serve two masters, God and money. You'll hate one, love the other, or else the other way around. Bob Buford wrote a great book recently entitled Halftime. How to move from success to significance in your life. And in that book, he talks to you early on about write, putting a box down here that is typical of your life and saying what is the most important thing to you in your life, write it in that box. Is your family most important? Is your relationship with God most important? Is your money most important? Is your job right? Whatever's most important to you in the box. Because until you're honest enough to get in the box, the real answer to what's most important to you, you'll never get your life together. A lot of men have struggled reading that book. Impossible to have two masters. And then Jesus said these words one day. If you give, you'll get. Your gift will be returned to you in full and overflowing measure, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, and running over whatever measure you use to give, large or small, will be used to measure what is given back to you. Now I want to read you an unsolicited letter. I have never met the man that wrote this letter. He wrote me one last January, and in that one he wrote last January... He said that he had decided that they ought to give 10% of their income to the church as the Lord requested. And I wrote him back and said, uh, thank you and God bless you and I want to meet you. 
We've gotten his checks regularly, but I've never met the man until his letter came the other day. Let me read it to you. Dear Buf, in January, I wrote you a brief letter expressing my written commitment to start giving 10% of my income to the church as the Lord has requested, not as Buf has requested. He's got the message straight to start with. Since that time, a lot of things have happened that I believe are a direct result of that decision. To be honest with you, Buf, when I decided to give up my 10% of my income to the Lord, I was not extremely concerned about it. Although we're not wealthy by any stretch of the imagination, doing without 10% was not going to put us into bankruptcy. In fact, I merely realized that we were not really giving up anything, but rather simply returning a small portion of what the Lord had already given to us. Then a couple of weeks after I sent you that letter and my first check, my boss explained the new 1995 compensation plan for our sales staff. The new plan was drastically different from what our previous plan was, and in short, my income was cut by over 25% effective immediately. Needless to say, I was furious and extremely concerned. One of the first things that went through my mind was that a 25% reduction in income added to a 10% return to the Lord meant that my family now had to figure out how we could live on 35% less money. As I stated previously, a 10% cut was something we could handle, but 35%? Now that's a totally different situation. A lot of things went through my mind. I thought at first that I would have to stop giving the money to the Lord because it was more than we could handle. We would need it to pay our bills. However, I had given my word to you and to the Lord. I had put it in writing, and you had even discussed it in one of your sermons. How could I go back on that promise? I was very worried about how I could pay our bills and keep giving to the church. Then I asked myself the question, why would the Lord put me in a position to have my income reduced by so much just when I had decided to finally start doing as he had asked? Why would he want to have less money given back to him? Why would he make this commitment such a burden for us to handle? Then it hit me like a slap in the face. The answer was simple. It was too easy before. The Lord knew it and I knew it. Giving 10% when I had the money was not hard at all to do. But returning the money to the Lord when I didn't have it to spare, now that would take some sacrifice. At that moment, I decided that no matter what, I was going to keep my promise. My wife and I sat down and discussed what we could do to cut our expenses as much as possible. We would quit wasting money on things like dining out and using the mobile phone, buying new clothes and other things that we did not think about before. We even traded in our brand new 1995 gas guzzling van and got a small truck with a manual transmission and windows that you actually have to use your arm to roll down. And he puts in parentheses, what a sacrifice. <laughs> the point is that we made up our minds we would do whatever we needed to do to keep our promise, and we found out that we could make changes if we really wanted to. To those of you who have always been bargaining with God, always looking for a way to work a deal with God, there's the key thing, if we really want to. We'll obey the Lord. Then another thing happened. The company I worked for was recently purchased by an investment group. The new owners put a new person in charge of the sales and marketing department. That person came to California, looked me straight in the eye and told me I was too concerned about whether or not my customers were happy with our products. My job was to say whatever I needed to say and do whatever I needed to do to get a check and then move on down the road and forget I ever met that person that I should even change my home phone number if I needed to. I could not believe what I was hearing. I have never sold anything in that manner and had no intentions of doing so. Things seemed to be getting bad. My income was now 35% lower than before. My new boss expected me to be dishonest to make a sale and the market was slower than it had ever been. I had not made any decent sales in a long time. I kept praying every day and thanking God continually for all the good things he had provided for my family and asked that he would continue to watch over us. Then things started to improve for us. My boss gave me an unexpected phone call and told me that the company was going to reinstate my salary to its previous level. 
I never asked my boss why they were doing it, and he never offered any explanation. I assumed they had realized how angry the entire sales staff was over the matter and had merely changed their minds. But I later found out that this was done only for me. It was not reinstated for the rest of the staff. A short time later, I began working on a sale to a very large client. This was a huge project, and the competition was fierce. Our proposal was nearly three times as expensive as that of our competitor. The new boss wanted me to flat out lie about a couple of things on our bid so as to make things look better. I refused to do so and instead chose to earn their business by proving we were the better company and therefore worth the premium price we were asking. I spent the next four months working closely with this company and getting to know their business needs and matched our products to meet them and asked the Lord for help every step of the way. To make a long story short, we got the contract at the higher price and did not do anything dishonest in the process. Although I was thrilled to get the sale, I realized that this was no longer a company or a person I could work for. I love my job and truly believe we have great products to offer but I cannot work for a person who is dishonest. I once again asked the Lord to give me some guidance on what I should do, and I truly believed he would. Shortly after making the decision that I could not work for this company in the long term, I was talking to a friend on the phone who works for a national company and jokingly told him I needed a new job. He said he would check it out, and within a few days, a vice president from the company called me and got the ball rolling. He originally wanted me to come to work for him in Chicago, which we were not thrilled about, but were seriously considering. However, just as I was about to accept that position, a better opportunity with that same company became available right here in Fresno. This position sounded almost too good to be true, Buf. It was a sales position with a company that was dedicated to customer service. It would not require any overnight travel and therefore allow me to spend more time with my family. It was focused on reoccurring sales to an established customer base instead of always having to cold call on companies. And it was an established territory that was already generating an income opportunity of nearly $100,000 annually. I ask in prayer many times that if this was the right direction for me to take, that the Lord would make this opportunity become available. I believe that if it was as good as it sounded and the Lord wanted me to have this job, he would make this position available to me. I knew that this type of job did not come along very often and that there would be many people trying to get it. I put my faith in God and left the matter in his hands and once again, the Lord has given me the direction and guidance I had asked for. If I start this new job on August 1st. Meanwhile, my wife and I had been trying to have another baby for the last couple of years. We had both had medical tests done and found there was nothing wrong med medically with either of us. My wife even recently had exploratory surgery done to see if there was anything medically wrong with her. And after getting the news that everything looked just fine, she was really depressed and wanted to talk to a fertility doctor. We discussed the matter and both agreed that we had one wonderful child already. And if the Lord wanted to give us the privilege of having another one, he would. If not, then he wouldn't. We prayed about it and left the matter in his hands. About a month ago, we found out that my wife is pregnant again. Buf, after receiving my first letter, you wrote back and invited me to lunch. I must apologize for taking so long to respond to your invitation. I wanted to have some time to think through a few things first. I knew that if I agreed to meet with you, you would undoubtedly ask me a few simple questions that I wasn't sure I was ready to answer. Like, was I ready to commit my life to Christ? Was I ready to do the Timothy program? And was I ready to start getting more involved with the church? The guy knows me pretty well for somebody I've never met. <laughs> I have asked those questions to myself many times since I wrote you, and I'm ready to discuss my answers with you now. I would, however, like to make one selfish request. Instead of you and I going out to lunch, my family and I would greatly appreciate it if you and your wife could find the time to join us for a little cookout at our house some evening. I want you to meet my family and to give a prayer for our house. We're simple people who are trying to make the right decisions in life, and we would like to discuss some of these decisions with you in person. I know you're a busy man, that there are a lot of people in the church who have need of your time. We are not 
having a problem with our marriage or drugs or alcohol or money or a terminal illness, nor has there been a sudden death in our family. Therefore, I feel very selfish for making this request to you because I know that there are many families who are having those problems and need your time more than we do. But if you can find a spare evening or afternoon, we would certainly enjoy having you over for lunch or dinner. Thanks for taking time. I apologize for this letter being so long. God bless you and all the members of the church. Obedience. That's all that is. That's an obedience report. One couple deciding we'll obey the Lord. We'll obey the word. We will trust God that the things that he says are true, are really true. And we will watch him bring to pass in our lives his blessing. And I ask you the question, have you come to the place yet where you're willing to trust God with your money? That Deuteronomy passage, the purpose of the tithe is to teach us to put the Lord first in everything. And if the last thing you ever learn to do is to put the Lord first with your money, then you do a whole lot of living, get a whole lot of unnecessary bumps and bruises and scrapes and difficulties and all of that that you would not need to have if you had the courage to say, I'm going to put God first in everything. And that means I've got to start by giving God what belongs to him on a regular basis. I trust you'll read Matthew 6 out loud every day this week and let God deal with you and come to the place of making the commitments that he wants you to make for the sake of your own soul. If you're here and you're not a believer, this sermon was not for you. I'm not out trying to scrape money off people that don't know the Lord to run this church. If you're here and you're lost, God has a great lost and found department. It takes you to acknowledge I'm lost. Fill out a card and stick it in a box and let us help you. Come to Jesus Christ. We'd love to. Let's pray. Father, accept our thanks this morning for the openness of your word. So clear we need never stumble over it. We may attempt to apologize our way around our actions in relation to your word, but we certainly understand what the story is. We understand how it's supposed to work. And so I pray for your special touch on our people as they read this week. I'm thinking of how important it is for us to be obedient together. For in that great step of obedience, we would see doors open before us where we could be in, involved in building the kingdom of God at a rate much greater than currently we're doing. And so I ask, that this huge step of obedience would be faced this week. Bless my brother who has written me this letter. I look forward to meeting him one of these days. And I thank you for his testimony of your faithfulness and your grace in his life as he has covenanted with you to absolutely be obedient. Bless us as we go. I give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.